Good morning. Good morning. Uh, and welcome to worship at First Presbyterian Church of Saline. Whether you're joining us in person or virtually, we are glad you are with us. A few announcements before we begin. First, I'd like to welcome Reverend Renee Roderer, our celebrant, Jonathan Sills, our guest accompanist, and the French Horn Trio of Diane Newberry, David Goldberg, and Jeff Ash. The June Jamboree is next Sunday, June 19th. The festivities begin with worship at 1030, with activities and games for all ages after the service. Please sign up to help with setup and cleanup in Fellowship Hall. Members and friends are welcome. We hope you will join us for the fun event. More information will be presented during today's Minute for Mission. Flowers, now that the weather is getting warmer, flowers are starting to bloom. Please bring flowers to share God's beauty, full glory during Sunday worship. Sign up is available in Fellowship Hall. Please be sure to read your weekly connect for more information on all church activities. Thank you. Now let us come to get together in God's presence with gladness. Call to worship, please stand, if capable. Come, weary one, for God is in this place. Come, restless one, for God is in this place. Come, hopeful one, for God is in this place. Come, curious one, for God is in this place. God is in me. And God is in you. So in every place, in this place, God is here.
be seated. The call to confession. God invites us to a real relationship, a place where we are honest with ourselves, others, and God. Let's start here, confessing the uncomfortable truth of our sin together. Please join me in the prayer of confession. If we say we have no sin, we are not being honest, and the truth is not in us. Therefore, we confess to ourselves that we have often ignored our own privilege, even as we benefit from it, that we have not listened to the pain of others, but have instead dismissed it to keep ourselves comfortable, that we have hard work of belonging to each other, we also confess that we are better than this. Our sins are not all we are. With your help, God, we can change. We can listen, we can heal, and bring healing to others. We confess this possibility in the name of the one who makes all things possible. Amen. Now, silent confession. Let us silently bring our prayers of confession before God. Amen. We bring to God, we belong to each other. God does not look at us and see only sin. God sees belovedness. Believe that in Jesus Christ we are forgiven in ways we may never fully understand. This is good news. Amen. your heads for the prayer for illumination please soften us God so that we may approach your word without pride or rigidity show us Jesus what it means to belong to each other and to you stir us up spirit that these words may be made incarnate in our lives amen First scripture reading is from Isaiah 49, verses 1 through 7. Listen to the word of God. Listen to me, O coastlands. Pay attention, you peoples from far away. The Lord called me before I was born. While I was in my mother's womb, he named me. 
He made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. He made me a polished arrow in his quiver and hid me away. And he said to me, you are my servant, Israel, in whom I will be glorified. But I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing in vanity. Yet surely my cause is with the Lord, and my reward is with God. And now the Lord says, who formed me in the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him, and that Israel might be gathered to him. For I am honored in the sight of the Lord, and my God has become my strength. He says, It is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the survivors of Israel. I will give you a light to the nations that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel and his Holy One. To one deeply despised, abhorred the nation, by the nations and slave of the rulers, kings shall see and stand up princes and they shall prostrate themselves because the Lord who is faithful the Holy One of Israel who has chosen you this is the word of the Lord Second reading. Oh, there's a minute. Oh, wait. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Ha! Well, <laughs> so, so, I, I don't know who's supposed to give the minute permission. <laughs> Come on up. Come on up. Sorry. It's all right. It wasn't highlighted on mine either. Pilot. Yeah. Okay. I'm coming. It's all good. <laughs> good morning. Good morning. So I have to get this on. So my name's Terry Arrow. And those of you who know me will say, Terry, have we ever seen you in church without a dress on? <laughs> You're always dressed up, you have your jewelry on. Well, I did have to wear earrings. So I am dressed for, as an example of what you need to wear next week at the June Jamboree. We, I am so excited to invite everyone in the church and their families to our June Jamboree. Um, next Sunday, June 19th, for food, 
fellowship, and so much fun. We will begin at 1030 with our church service. I know some people are not comfortable coming to the service, so they may come at 1130 and participate in activities that are outside. Um, after the service, we'll move outside for a variety of activities. These will include a food truck, and I'm so excited. I've never had this uh, Bigalora pizza, but it sounds absolutely delicious. Um, we will have popcorn and uh, strawberry shortcake for dessert. Uh, yum, yum. Uh, <laughs> we will also have a DJ, um, a bounce house, um, a chance to learn to play euchre, or if you already know how, you'll get to play euchre with some friends. Uh, face painting from the White Pine Studios, plus many other games for adults and children. Um, we'll be doing a mission project, um, putting together uh, soap um, baggies for Hope Clinic um, and so that people there can do their laundry. And um, Mickey Armstrong has very, very carefully um, found supplies that are as environmentally friendly as possible. So mark your calendars for next Sunday and plan to spend part of your Father's Day um, celebrating your fathers with us in our church family. Also, we want to ask that um, if you're able to sign up to help set up or clean up, we would really appreciate that. We know somehow it always happens, but we would just like several people to just give us that heads up that they will be there. Set up will mostly be setting up chairs and tables. Um, we have tents um, in case it rains. Um, if it's really stormy or, or um, terrible weather, we'll move inside. Um, we're just so excited. Um, this is a celebration for the whole church to come together and just kind of reunite after these last couple of years. Thank you so much. I hope to see you there. Thank you. I'm excited too. And I can tell you that Big Alora Pizza is very good. I live right by there. <laughs> so thank you. And sorry, I almost cut you off there. I just got on autopilot. So delighted. Thank you for that. And our second scripture this morning comes to us from the Gospel according to John, chapter 16, verses 12 through 15. Listen again for God's word to us. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own, but will speak whatever he hears and will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me because he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. For this reason, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. This is the word of God for you, the people of God. Thanks be to God. I actually want to go back to that scripture that Mark read this morning. It is too light a thing, the words of Isaiah's prophecy say. Too small, too small. If there's anything that the people of Judah felt, that is, the people of Judah from the southern kingdom of Israel, I'm sure it involved the day-to-day -day reality of feeling too small. We are, of course, distanced in time from the people who are addressed in that prophecy, distant in culture, distant in experience. So it might be hard to wrap our minds around all of the suffering that these people were enduring, all that they had known. Too small. It would have been easy for the people of Judah to feel like the nobodies of the world. And this is all connected to trauma that they experienced. It's connected to an immense amount of upheaval in a specific year, and that year is 587 BC. 
Now to us, that's just a number. But to the people of Judah, that year was the watershed moment of their lives. It wasn't the beginning of the conflict they had with the Babylonians, but it was the year that solidified Judah's defeat to the Babylonians. And the kingdom of Babylon was a force to be reckoned with, not only when it came to Judah, but the entire region of the Near East. And so with Babylon on the prowl as an ever-expanding empire, the other kingdoms of that region were terrified, fearing that their own destruction was imminent. And so that brings us to a quick history lesson. (laughs) In 597, 10 years before the final defeat of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar II, the king of Babylon, led an army to Jerusalem and put the city under siege, cutting the people off from food and safe access in and out of the city. So the Babylonians weakened the city to the point that they were eventually able to break through the city walls. And when they did, they just wreaked havoc on Jerusalem. They plundered the city and the temple. The most sacred place of worship and the place of self-identity for the people of Judah. And then they deported the king of Judah along with 10,000 others, prominent leaders of the people in Judah. And so the people of Judah were left with a sweeping void of leadership. And as difficult as that was, that was only a taste of what was to come. Because 10 years later, in 587 BC, that watershed moment, Babylon left nothing untouched. For two years, the Babylonians put Jerusalem under another siege. They cut off the people from the outside world. And then in 587, they broke through the walls. They destroyed the city for a second time, homes and lives and they made captives of nearly all of the survivors. But before they moved the captives of Judah into the foreign land of Babylon, the Babylonians gave them one last ghastly searing image for them. The Babylonian army burned the temple to the ground. They made dust of it. They destroyed this most sacred place of the people They destroyed the place where they believed God actually dwelled with them. And so can we imagine what kind of sorrow must they have felt and the fear and the confusion? So the people of Judah were taken to live in a foreign land, a place they had never lived with foreign customs and a different language, a different worldview, a different religion, different ways of worshiping gods that weren't their own. And so they were a disenfranchised, defeated, second-class group of exiles. And of course, that put them into spiritual confusion, too. Where was God in all of this? Had God abandoned them? Is it any wonder that the people of Judah felt like they were too small for this world? They had lost pretty much everything. Too small. Too small for the world to care. And maybe they wondered if they were too small for God to care. But God had something to say about that in this book of Isaiah. A prophet arrives with a word for the people, and it is a word of hope. It is a word of identity for them. In effect, these prophetic words are just flying in the face of all the heartache that the Judeans knew and were living. And these words seem to say, don't you know whose you are? And since you belong to a God who loves and a God who saves, don't you know who you're called to be? Don't you know? Don't you know whose you are? And so the words of this passage from Isaiah seem to rise up out of all the ashes, creating an alternative vision for the future of Judea, for the future of the Jewish people, 
the future of all who put their trust and hope and faith in God. Too small for this world? No. Though through the words of the prophet, God has something to say about that self-understanding. And in these words, God turns that self-understanding on its head. Isaiah says, listen to me, O coastlands. Pay attention, peoples from far away. The Lord called me before I was born, while I was in my mother's womb. God named me. And God said to me, you are my servant, Israel, in whom I will be glorified. Too small an identity? No, here's what's too small. And the Lord now says, who formed me in the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him, that Israel might be gathered to him. God says, it is too light a thing that you should be my servant and raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the survivors of Israel. I will give you as a light to the nations that my salvation may reach the ends of the earth. It is too light a thing, too small a thing for you, Judah, and people of Israel to gather up your own tribes and your own survivors. That's huge, but it's too small. You are a light to the nations that salvation may reach everywhere. Do you know whose you are? Now what a message. The prophet's message does seem to rise out of the ashes. Babylonian dust will not be the last word. And it wasn't. Without God's pledge of love toward the people of Judah, we wouldn't even have a Hebrew Bible, by the way, to hear these words this morning, to know about the heartache of exile and the eventual return to that homeland nearly 70 years later. Because nearly 70 years later, the people of Judah did leave Babylon and return to their homeland, and our identity is in fact connected to theirs. Our faith is sustained upon their convictions too. Because when they returned, they assembled the texts of the Hebrew Bible. Some already existed, but they put them together, and it's what we call the Old Testament. And apart from that testimony, we would not be who we are either. And so a disenfranchised, defeated, second-class group of exiles, empowered by God, articulated a faith that sustains people in every corner around the world. The Judeans returned to their homeland, something that was nearly unthinkable. And then the people of Judah spoke this hope to the entire world. And sometimes it takes going to a different place to get perspective in a new way. Sometimes that's so true. And we are receiving from them even this day. Now, I have also had that experience on a much smaller level of going to a new place and then seeing life in a new way. I bet you have too. Uh, ten, 12 years ago, I took a really meaningful trip to Germany with my family, and it was a really incredible time. It was filled with gorgeous views and a sense of history. And on that journey, we decided to take an impromptu trip to France, just one day. We crossed over the border between Germany and France and stayed one night in Strasbourg. And I'm just curious if any of you have ever been in Strasbourg. Ooh, I see a few hands. I love it. Okay, I'm also hoping you have seen some of the things I've seen there. And there were many points of interest in Strasbourg, uh, including the church where John Calvin was a pastor, um, our, our, the theologian who is very connected to our own Presbyterian tradition. Um, in fact, I, I remember we just stumbled upon it while we were walking outside. All of a sudden there was a sign, this is John Calvin's church. I was like, wow. So there was a lot to see. But without uh, a doubt, the most awe-inspiring thing to me was the Strasbourg Cathedral. So have you all who raised your hands, did you see the cathedral, I'm hoping? Yeah, I'm seeing some nods. It's really an understatement to say that it is awe-inspiring. It's a Gothic 
masterpiece of architecture. And it, the construction for it began in the year, or approximately, around 1100. Wow, <laughs> what an old thing we have. And it was completed in the 1400s. So for 300 years, approximately eight generations of people created a monument which is more intricate than just about anything I've ever seen. Everywhere you look, there's a carving here, a statue there, stained glass windows towering everywhere. And it's as if every single thing in this cathedral had significance. And I just marveled at all of these details, and I did feel a sense of awe there as all these intricate parts seemed to point toward God what was most ultimate in that space. And now I'm enough of a historical realist to know that when a city spends 300 years building a cathedral, part of the reasoning behind it is to flex a muscle toward other cities. <laughs> but that being said, the vision for this cathedral seemed so large, and I would even say cosmic. The structure is built in the shape of a huge cross, and signs in the cathedral said that it was to represent a ship to bring all of humanity to God. All of humanity. There's nothing too small about that. But even if this cathedral was in part built to flex a very large muscle, I have to say that as I looked around, I found myself truly in awe, reflecting how much faith it must have taken to build this structure. It takes faith to do this. After all, only a strong faith in God's presence would be worth this much time and this much detail and this much effort and this much money. And maybe the builders of the Strasbourg Cathedral felt connected to that larger sense of whose they are. And it must have taken so much faith to put trust in each other as well. Think about that. It would have been difficult to put all that wealth and time and effort and money and sweat into such an endeavor, knowing you would not see it completed in your lifetime. So eight generations of lives of individuals and communities built this beautiful church and I wonder, did the innumerable people who contributed to this work feel that their part, no matter how small, was connected to something infinitely larger than themselves? I like to think about that. And I wonder, were they in any way aware that they were not too small from this world, that they were a part of something larger than they could imagine? including they who had received these sacred texts, also put together through the inspiration of the Spirit, also molded together by a second-class group of exiled people. Amazing. Well, today that cathedral speaks to innumerable tourists, people from all over the world, all of humanity, we might say, who visit the city of Strasbourg and 900 years later, it is still standing for us to receive. It still points and acts as a witness to God and to the community for the benefit of the larger world. I do love that. Anything less would be too small. <laughs> so here we are on an ordinary Sunday morning. We might feel like it's pretty ordinary and mundane. I feel that sometimes. But if our vision for this moment is just mundane, we're actually playing it too small. Now, First Presbyterian Church of Selene has not experienced anything close to a Babylonian exile, and thank goodness. But I bet if we reflected deeply enough, we might discover we've had moments when we internally felt like we were living a sense of exile. And that can take so many forms, as we know. And we remember people in our community and, and beyond our community who have an ancestors who have lived things like this. Or people who are living these kinds of hardships now. They do exist in this world. We remember them. And we're called to proclaim hope, to challenge ourselves whenever we view someone else as a second-class group of exiles. 
whatever form that might take. And though we're grateful for this sanctuary here at First Presbyterian Church of Selene, we're, we're not really housed in a Gothic piece of architecture, but we do have these beautiful stained glass windows and these pews and this sacred Bible and, and so many other things. But we would be missing something if on this ordinary morning together we forgot to remind ourselves of whose we are and what it's all for and what it's all about. And we'd be missing something if we forgot who we are in light of all of this, who we are in light of this amazing pledge of God who keeps showing up in these texts, in these lives, in the spirit that is among us. And so I turn this question to you, this church today, this holy, beloved community of God. Do you know whose you are? Do you know? Do you know you've been claimed and loved with a love that is beyond our imagination? Do you know who you're called to be in light of that love and that vision? Do you know it would be too small a thing if we just viewed ourselves as simple sanctuary dwellers this morning? It would be too small a thing for us to sit in these pews and miss the mystery of God's spirit that keeps claiming us and loving us through and through. And as you sit here in beautiful but common pews, just know that you are surrounded by a holy community that God keeps calling. Neighbors and friends and chosen family. And to know that each person here contains worlds within themselves whole worlds. And have you ever thought about how every person is a community of worlds, how they represent people and places and histories and memories and hopes and dreams, and that you represent these two? Because of whose you are, you bring all of that into this place. And because of whose our neighbors are, that's terrible grammar, um, we, are, we, we keep being called outward. <laughs> to be with them, and just know that this nexus of relationships really can change things for ourselves and for this world. And so nothing you do is insignificant because of whose you are. <laughs> nothing is insignificant. So keep belonging and serving and envisioning and dreaming and just being <laughs> whose you are this day and forever. Amen.
uh, sing our af- sing. We will speak our affirmation of faith together. Let us do that together. We trust in God, whom Jesus called Abba, Father. In sovereign love, God created the world good and makes everyone equally in God's image, male and female, of every race and people to live as one community. But we rebel against God. We hide from our creator, ignoring God's commandments. We violate the image of God in others and ourselves, accept lies as truth, exploit neighbor and nature, and threaten death to the planet entrusted in our care. We deserve God's condemnation, yet God acts with justice and mercy to redeem creation. Please be seated. We are called to hold the gifts we have been given with hands open, ready to share. We do not hoard or hold tightly to what we own because we do not own much but borrow it for a time. Let us give from a place of abundant love and mindful care, knowing with God there is more than enough.
Use these gifts, God, to do more than we could believe or imagine, building a world of justice and healing where there is enough for all. Amen. Please be seated. And let us pray for one another and this world that we love. Let us pray to God together. God, we do thank you for this time and place, for the ways that your presence makes it sacred. And we ask that we would receive from this time and place, from you, from our loved ones here, from a vision that calls us outward, blessed and empowered by the Holy Spirit to do your work and your will, to feel your joy, to live a vision that is beautiful in a world that is longing for so much more than we currently experience. We thank you for the simple joys that are a part of our lives, for flowers, for warm air and the wonderful sun that we feel on our back, for the laughter of friends, for the inquisitiveness of children, for beautiful scenery, for good memories that emerge suddenly in our thinking. We give you thanks for all of these and we pray for one another, knowing that you have called us to journey through life together. And so we pray for each other as questions emerge, as diagnoses are received, as people go through grief or pain, and as people express sacred possibility big hopes and dreams for this church, for our larger lives, and for this world. Today, we especially pray for Linda Brown and her larger family with this loss of her mother. And we remember this beautiful life that has given great love to others, too. We pray for all people who are dealing with the struggles of this time, whether that is COVID or inflation or difficult gas prices and knowledge of what's happening in the world, violence close to home and also in other nations. We pray for the discernment of the pastoral nominating committee that is seeking a designated pastor. We pray for their discernment and their leadership and guidance. And we pray for the person who will come and be this pastor. We ask that you would give us a sense of sacred calling and that even when we leave this place, it is not mundane, but we are following you. We are honoring you and we belong to you and one another. And so in all these needs and joys, concerns, visions, those that have been named and those that have not, we do pray to you. And we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
and so it is true. <laughs> Go out into this world from this time and place beyond walls of stone into what it means to be church beyond following this Jesus who goes before us. And so may the creativity of the one who made you go with you, and the compassion of the one who claims you go with you, and the courage of the one who stirs you to action go with you. And so go into peace this day and always. Amen. Amen.